a closer look. With the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell fast approaching, we'll examine what this means for the military. Thank you for everything. Joining forces, First Lady Michelle Obama and Dr. Jill Biden travel north to deliver a big thank you to military families. Fire Dogs. We'll meet this elite expeditionary wing, which is called in when things get hot under the collar. Daddy, 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 daddy. And happy homecoming. Tiny hugs for dads and moms returning from a tour of duty. Around the Services starts right now. Now, proudly serving those who serve. This is Around the Services. Hello and welcome, I'm Petty Officer Michael Wilkin. On September 20th, the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy will be repealed. The clock started ticking Friday after Commander-in-Chief Barack Obama, along with Defense Secretary Leon Panetta and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mike Mullen, certified they were satisfied the forces properly prepared for the repeal. Here's a look at the events that led us to this historic point in time. The origin of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy was back in 1993. Under the directive issued by President Bill Clinton, military applicants would no longer be asked about their sexual orientation. The policy stayed firmly in place over the next 17 years. But in a 2010 State of the Union address, President Barack Obama said the time had come to repeal the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. This year, I will work with Congress and our military to finally repeal the law that denies gay Americans the right to serve the country they love because of who they are. Over the next several months, hearings and studies were done about what impact a repeal would have on the military and its readiness. But when you take into account the overriding imperative to get this right and minimize disruption to a force that is actively fighting two wars and working through the stress of almost a decade of combat, then it is clear to us we must proceed in a manner that allows for the thorough examination of all issues. Last November, the Pentagon released a comprehensive report which concluded that leadership, training, and education would mitigate challenges in implementing a repeal of the policy. Less than one month later, on December 22nd, the president signed the Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal Act of 2010. The law states the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy will be repealed 60 days after the president Defense Secretary and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff certify the force as properly prepared for the repeal. At that point, each of the services went to work, providing training for service members, preparing them for what the repeal would mean to them. And while this repeal will be viewed by some as a historic moment for the military, many service members say they'll hardly notice any difference in their day-to-day -day lives. I don't think there will be much change because the uh, it, it's just, uh, like they said, Marines' personal, um, their sexual orientation does not have, it doesn't come up in everyday conversation. It's not something we're going to discriminate or judge other Marines by. Don't Ask, Don't Tell will be repealed on September 20th. Well, we're headed downrange in just a few minutes, but first, let's go to the Pentagon Channel Newsroom for the latest headlines. <laughs> I'm Sergeant First Class E.L. Craig. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff focused on his recent trip to Asia during a speech at the Foreign Press Center Monday. Admiral Mike Mullen said the trip was part of a commitment that the United States has to foster better bonds with China, even though the two countries still battle what he calls substantive issues. The Chinese object to Taiwan arms sales. We object to the use of coercion in settling disputes in the South China Sea. The Chinese don't like our routine reconnaissance flights in international airspace. And we don't like any attempt to inhibit freedom of navigation and access to the global commons. Admiral Mullen said developing a military relationship with China is important to U.S. interests, but that should not dominate thinking, planning, and force posture decisions. And President Barack Obama and top defense officials are expressing condolences on the death of retired General John Shalikashvili. The former chairman of the Joint Chiefs died Saturday of complications from a stroke. He was 75. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta called him one of the country's finest generals and an extraordinary patriot who faithfully defended the nation for four decades. The general served as chairman of the Joint Chiefs from 1993 to 1997. And in their most recent opportunity to say thank you, First Lady Michelle Obama and Dr. Jill Biden visited a National Guard armory in Concord, New Hampshire. 
during the event. Michelle Obama took time to express her appreciation, while Dr. Biden related to the audience on a personal level. Thank you for your service. Uh, thank you for your sacrifice. Uh, thank you for everything that you have done for our country. My son, Bo, is a captain in the Delaware Army National Guard, and he recently spent a year in Iraq. So I know well the challenges that Guard families face. The First and Second Ladies Joining Forces initiative is designed to bring attention to the unique needs and strength of the military family. The Tuskegee Airmen were recently honored for their heroic service with a highway. The group of young men broke racial barriers when they enlisted during World War II. They enlisted to serve, protect, and preserve America's freedom, but some of the original World War II Tuskegee Airmen say it wasn't easy for a black man to join the military. He said we could not do different things because we did not have the brain capacity. And the first letter of rejection that I received said straight out, there are no facilities to train Negroes to fly in any branch of the American military service. And South Carolina lawmakers are honoring the heroes by naming a stretch of I-95 the Tuskegee Airmen Memorial Highway. And for the latest military news, signature programming, and more, head to pentagonchannel.mil. I'm Sergeant First Class E.L. Craig with your Pentagon Channel News Update. The U.S. Air Force Academy recently tested its newly purchased gliders to make sure they were safe for cadets. Jet Favara takes us to Edwards Air Force Base in California for more. When it comes to the U.S. Air Force, acquiring aircraft involves more than just purchasing one. You then have to test it. With the U.S. Air Force Academy's recent purchase of 19 new gliders, to replace some of its aging gliders, the 445th Flight Test Squadron at Edwards Air Force Base has the job of testing one of the Academy's new TG-16A gliders. We've been tasked by uh, AETC and the, uh, the SPO for the Air, uh, Air Force Academy to uh, make sure that the new gliders that they just purchased uh, are going to be safe for their cadet uh, indoc indoctrination training and also uh, it's going to be a, a dual purpose glider that's going to be used for their aerobatic training program for the cadets. The so for all program or the glider training that's done by the Air Force Academy is the introduction to flight for the Air Force Academy cadets. Uh, you're taking uh, young 18 and 19 year olds uh, that are going to go into a career in the Air Force. Uh, they're going to need to be air power experts and yet many of them never had any flying experience of their own. Uh, so these gliders are going to be their first time sitting in the front cockpit of an, of an airplane uh, with or without a, uh, an engine, uh, but they get to feel the, the thrill of flight and the basic principles. So whether they're going to be a JAG or an uh, air battle manager or, or, a, or a pilot, uh, everybody gets a basic uh, understanding of what it's like to be in the air and fly these new airplanes. In addition to testing how the glider reacted to differing weight distribution, team members had to test additional parameters in order to certify this type of aircraft for its next phase of testing. We're doing some uh, spin checks to see how resistant it is uh, to ensure that a cadet or someone with no flying experience can fly this safely. So our, the test pilots here are going to gauge that as well. Once we finish this out, which will take us uh, probably another week, our, our next task here at uh, Edwards Air Force Base is to make sure that the crosswind component, its ability to land in, in high winds, uh, will be safe. So we're waiting for gusty winds, uh, and we're going to uh, make sure that we can take it out toward uh, 20 knots of crosswind or so. Uh, following that, uh, we're going to take this glider and uh, a couple others that are currently being delivered to the Air Force Academy, and we're going to uh, take them through its, take the glider through its paces in its operational environment, uh, and. The tow plane, which is here at Edwards, isn't the same one they use at the, at the Air Force Academy. So we want to make sure that takeoff performance is done in, in its environment uh, in the heat of the summer where takeoff performance is the worst and make sure it's still safe for cadet operations. Jet Fabera, Edwards Air Force Base, California. Coming up ahead on Around the Services, we'll show you some safe ways to exercise in extreme heat. But first, we head downrange for a handover ceremony in Panjir Province, Afghanistan. going into space. At five, fighting fires. And as an adult, you chose to serve your country. Now you're thinking about college. 
Whether for your bachelor's or an advanced degree, the post 9-11 GI Bill can help. Most of your expenses could be covered, like tuition and fees, housing, and books. The post 9-11 GI Bill, it just makes sense. Visit gibill.va.gov. Hey, Fox. Hey, Washington. How's it going, bro? Hey, man. Physical therapy makes Kandahar look like summer camp. I end up wanting like Jackson. Jackson. But I tell you, that dude was a trip. That's the truth. So how about you, man? How you doing? Well, it's like you said. The sessions are tough, but I got to get back on track. So it is helping? Yeah, man. I've been asleep like a baby. I even went easier in the class six. All right, man. I'm glad you made that call to the hotline. Yeah, man. Me too. I'm a veteran, and these services are for us. I want them here for my appointment. We've earned them. Whether your wounds are visible or not, treatment works. Treatment works. Treatment works. And calling the Confidential Veterans Hotline can help. I know. Call 800-273-8255 and press 1. NATO ISAF is investigating the crash of one of its helicopters Monday in eastern Afghanistan. An ISAF statement says coalition forces trying to secure the crash site were fired on by enemy forces, but were able to transport the chopper's crew and passengers to safety. In Kabul, Ryan Crocker was sworn in as the new U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan. Ambassador Crocker said the U.S. will remain in Afghanistan only as long as needed. Our sole interest is in Afghanistan's security, in sustainable stability and ensuring it will never again become a haven for international terrorism that poses a threat to the international community. Ryan Crocker has also served as U.S. Ambassador to Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, Kuwait and Lebanon. NATO troops handed over security for Panjir province in northeastern Afghanistan over the weekend. This caps the initial transition phase of security control in Afghanistan. During the transition ceremony, Commander of ISAF Joint Command, Lieutenant General Curtis Scaparotti, restated the ISAF priorities, expressing that ISAF does not plan to get away from those priorities. Main priorities remain unchanged. Build and reinforce the Afghan government's competence and capacity in the unified effort to protect the population connect the people to their government and enable sustainable development to improve the lives of the Afghan people. The defense and security of the Afghan people are the center of our efforts. The security handovers completed in the past week are the first step in a process that aims to put the Afghan army and police in control across the country by the end of 2014. Well, despite that recent security handover, NATO troops will remain in the country in a limited capacity beyond 2014. That's according to the commander of the NATO training mission, Lieutenant General William Caldwell, who briefed reporters on Monday. We're going to be here well beyond 2014. So we've, in fact, laid out a plan that enables them to take the lead for security by the end of 2014. But we will not have finished fully professionalizing the police and army force nor we will have finished putting all the systems in the place by that time. The biggest thing that's going to make a real difference here is, is when the Afghans take the lead for security themselves. When the Afghans are among the people, what we find is that the people are much more receptive, open, and willing to work with them than perhaps they are with the coalition forces, which is, you know, in some respects very logical. And so the more that we're able to put them out in front, give them the lead for security, the less the probability is that the people uh, will, you know, have the challenges that perhaps we face with them. Lieutenant General Caldwell said when he first took over in Afghanistan, Afghan forces faced significant challenges, but significant progress has been made in the past 20 months. That's a look at what's happening downrange. Remember, you can download or watch these stories anytime on demand at pentagonchannel.mil.
these test subjects are going to help us find the best way to stay informed. Their task, finding all of today's top military news stories dealing with just the Pacific. Let's see what happens. On the right, Lance has access to every cable news network on TV. On the left, Johnny is using stripes.com. I can't say I'm surprised. Testing complete. This is an acceptance letter. It's a diploma. It's a passport. It's a compass. It's a trainer and a coach and the jersey of the greatest team on earth. It's more than a uniform. It's an education you can't get anywhere else. There's strong and then there's army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Your PCS isn't complete until you fill out your customer satisfaction survey. If your move didn't go well, or even if it went great, we want to hear about it. Your feedback tells us which moving company should receive more shipments and which one should not. Visit move.mil and click on DPS login to access and fill out your customer satisfaction survey. Make everyone's next move a better one at move.mil. Welcome back. When fire breaks out aboard a military aircraft, it's the fire dogs from the 386 Air Expeditionary Wing who are called in to put it out. Staff Sergeant Peter Ising takes us to Southwest Asia where intense training for this unit recently got underway. Being a firefighter requires constant training. The fire dogs from the 386th Air Expeditionary Wing are on their way to an army base in Southwest Asia where they will be conducting live fire training on a C-130 simulator. Throughout their careers, these airmen will go through many more drills like this in order to keep their skills sharp and to learn any new techniques or changes in regulations. Currently outside, it's 115 degrees, but once the C-130 simulator is lit, the temperature inside can reach as high as 300. Also, the boots, pants, jackets, gloves, oxygen mask, and oxygen tank can add up to 70 pounds of extra weight. So, fighting a fire? Come on, how hard can that be? Well, I'm about to find out. Just standing there in full gear, I felt like I was born to do this. But then it hit me how much all this gear weighed, and I knew this was a bad idea. Putting the fire out was no easy task. Just when you think you've put the fire out, it comes back. You can feel the beads of sweat running down your face due to the tremendous heat coming off the aircraft. However, that was nothing compared to how hot it was inside. Once we had put the fire out, I had to get out of that suit. Heavy, hot. I like, I'm spinning right now. I need to go back to public affairs. Like right now. To my cushy desk. Alright, let's do it again. Where's everybody going? That's it? We're done? Yeah, that's it. That's it? Oh, come on. They can barely keep up with me out there. On this day, the 386th Air Expeditionary Wing's firefighters turned this boy into a man. Reporting from Southwest Asia, I'm Staff Sergeant Peter Ising. Well, the summer heat wave may make us feel like we're on fire, but there are ways to beat the heat and stay healthy. During high heat days, it may be better to work out inside to avoid heat exhaustion. And that shouldn't be a problem for service members living on base where gyms offer air conditioning and several classes to stay fit. You can work out inside. We have treadmills, ellipticals. Uh, we also offer classes here. You can take a Zumba class, a turbo kick class. We also have um, P90X for run out. You can check that out with us. 
Experts say drinking water 15 to 20 minutes before and after workouts is crucial to keep your body from overheating. You may also want to work out early in the morning or later in the evening when it's cooler. Well, these hot summer temps make a day at the pool another cool option for military families to beat the heat. Staff Sergeant Joe Wolston takes us to Inderlick for some tips on how to stay safe while you're swimming. The first element of safety in the sun is preparation. Use sunblock. It is a simple safety tip and can prolong outdoor activities by limiting exposure to the sun. Outdoor activities have hazards. At the swimming pool, for instance. If a kid doesn't know how to swim, it's a problem. So you have to take care of the kid all time. Following the rules of the pool helps everyone enjoy their experience. Here at Inderlich's pool, the rules are posted. Most pools have these signs, but which one is most important? Don't jump backwards. It's a really important thing because you didn't see your backwards and you're jumping off. You can't hit your head or you can hit someone else. You have to not run because if you're shallow, then you could slip and fall. If you don't know how to swim, don't dive in and then go to your limit. No hanging on the ropes. And wait your turn at the slide. If you eat a lot, you should get back in the pool right away. You should wait or you'll get cramps. And of course, stay safe and have fun. No rough play, no horse play. That was a trick question. All the rules are equally important. At a swimming pool, there are thousands of gallons of reasons to be a little cautious when playing in or around the water. So the next time there's a trip to the pool on the horizon, take a second look at the rules. You'd think it was common sense, but if you see someone breaking the rules, don't wait for that whistle. If it's unsafe for one, it could affect all. Staff Sergeant Joe Wolston, Injurlik Air Base, Turkey. Coming up next on Around the Services, Happy Homecoming, a National Guard unit returns to a warm welcome. The call to serve, it has no sound, yet I have heard it in the whispered retelling of honorable sacrifices made by those who have served before me. The call to serve has no form, yet I have clearly seen it in the eyes of men and women infinitely more courageous and more driven than most. The call to serve has no weight, yet I have held it in my hands. I will commit to carry it close to my heart until my country is safe and the anguish of those less fortunate has been soothed. The call to serve is at once invisible and always present. And for those who choose to answer the call, for their country, for their fellow man, for themselves, it is the most powerful force on Earth. America's Navy, a global force for good. To answer the call, go to Navy.com or call 1-800-USA-NAVY. Victor Ray, this is Scorpion 23 traveling west on MSR. He was there when his country needed him, and we'll be there when he needs his country. Join us and send your message of support to our wounded warriors at USO.org. The USO, until everyone comes home. If you stay in the military long enough, there is a pretty good chance you will deploy. And as tough as deployments are on service members, they can be even tougher on the families left behind. But that toughness also makes the homecomings that much sweeter. Three-year-old Selena Avizi couldn't wait to get back into the arms of her dad. It's the embrace that was months in the making and was never guaranteed. A specialist in the National Guard, David Avizi, was a medic sent far from his East Long Meadow home into the war-torn regions of Afghanistan. 
For the next nine months, the Middle East would be home. You know, every day it was nagging, you know, not knowing what was going on and, you know, if he was safe. His mom, Laureen, could only communicate through Facebook and Skype. And even on the day her son makes his return, she says those months away were the most grueling of her life. And it doesn't get easier. They just still worry, you know, until I see him. Yeah. So here she was, Lorene, one of about 200 in the crowd at Agawam Armory, waiting for their guardsmen to return. Here they come. Through the line of buses and peering over the fatigues, it took only a minute before this family was whole again. Welcome home for you. Oh, thank you. Nothing's like being at home, you know. You just It's surprising the stuff that you miss, like uh, um, we were in Manus and we had real milk for the first time. Sometimes it's the small things that make you feel at home but nothing can compare to the people who make up the home. I just want I just want to get my life back. I want, you know. I'm so pretty. You are so pretty. And today is the first day on his road to getting it back. Well, I can tell you from experience, there's nothing better than returning home to a hug from your kids. I'm Petty Officer Michael Wilkin. For everyone here at the Pentagon Channel, thanks for watching. We leave you from the 5th International Military Sports Council World Games in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. 7,000 troops from 100 countries participated. The games ended on Sunday.